Yo, this is Art of Architect with More Than a Haircut Podcast. Man, I hope all is well with everybody. Got a special guest originally from, I thought he was from Memphis. Well, he is from Memphis. Uh, by way of Washington, D.C. I got my boy, Singer Bromfield. Hey, man, tell the people what's up, man. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate everybody checking in. Thank you, brother, for finally having me on your podcast and your platform. That's a, a blessing to be here, to be able to share conversation and words and knowledge with you, man, history. Yeah. Hey, this, really is, this history in the making for me, too, man, because I remember, man, just, just watching you just – your name kept coming up, then you kept vibing, you just kept, you know, stay down. And now to see yeah. where you are, I was just like, man, let me let me hit bro up, man, see what's going on. So before we even get started, this is something different I'm doing, like, tell the people where they can find you at. We also gonna do it at the end too, though. Okay, for sure. Well, my name is Singer Bromfield. I go by Singer B. You can check me out. It's on Spotify, on YouTube, on SoundCloud. Um, and all other major platforms where music is being streamed and played as Singer B. Um, I'm with TRE Productions, signing my own label, my own self. Yeah. Some people say independent. I'm from, like you said, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. I was born in DC. I was raised in Memphis all my life. Yeah. And uh, right now I'm in Los Angeles. I've been out here for about a year, a little over a year. Mm -hmm. I've been doing my music out here in Hollywood. So, so my question before we even get into everything, I need a shirt, a hat. Um, so, gotcha. you know what I'm saying? I need, I need. So my I, got, I got plenty of them. I got. I'm looking uh, at a whole pile of merch over here. But also, I need to, I need to get my consultant fee. So if anybody chime <laughs> in and see that, you know what I'm saying? They need a, they need a verse. They need a hook. They need, you know what I'm saying? No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. So, I wanted to start. I want to start from the current the current time where you are, and then I want to work back. You know what I'm saying? Because people are gonna to have to go back and see, and and you know what I'm saying, gather themselves and, and find more information about you. So like, um, where are you currently in your musical journey? You know what I'm saying today. Right, right now I would say that I'm in like a very pivotal position to where. In one hand, I have the decision, or rather the option to be able to establish a relationship with like a major label. And in the other hand, it's sustaining and continuing my own independent machine and, uh, you know, collectively it's working together with my debut release of uh, some new content and music that I've been working on. And, um, it, the name of the single that I'm releasing this upcoming, well, actually next, the same time next week, August the 6th, 2020, will be All I Got. All and I that's, got. yeah, and that's released under T, TRE Productions uh, through uh, United Masters um, Distribution. So we got an exclusive interview. I like, I, I like that. I like that. So what's the, uh, what's the name of the song or what's, you know, if you can, if you could tell us. If not, yeah, it's, it's called. Yeah, it's called All I Got. Okay. So it's dropping. You got a video coming with it, or it's just a single? Yeah, I got the video coming with it as well. Right now, if you still want to kind of get some insight, exclusive footage, and you know, a little listening on what it sounds like, it's a video on YouTube right now okay. of uh, the behind the scenes footage. But um, like you like you asked, the music video and the single is both releasing at the same time. All right. So, you know, something that I've been thinking about with younger artists, because that's why I brought the consultant thing up or the consultant information, only because I feel like, I always feel like I'm a bridge, I'm a bridge gapper. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. what I think about, you know, with the younger artists is like, have you thought about doing a, a mini movie? Definitely. To, to go, you know, to go along with, your vibe or what, what you're doing. So that way it's like, not only are you hitting with a song, you might hit with a message. You might just hit with a vibe, just something, you know what I'm saying? Just something different, something creative to where it's like, your music is playing in the background. Your shot right, might be right. hit, you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, most definitely. Um, 
I, I, I was working, uh, I was really, I actually was planning on releasing a documentary a few albums back on my album called Leaving Home. And I just, I didn't release the whole uh, piece. I just released clips, different segments from different uh, Grammy award winning artists and um, Oscar nominated, I mean, Oscar award winning artists and stuff like that. Um, but I didn't release the whole piece. And so the reason why I didn't do that because I feel like it was still missing the meat, it was still missing something. Right. And so since then I've still been documenting and filming, we've been uh, filming and putting together a piece um, adding to the, the, the production. And um, to specifically answer your question, do we have something that we're gonna release along with the single in the video? Not at this time, Okay. but we are working on um, a big production about my life uh, in a movie form. Okay, uh, that makes sense. That makes sense. So I know you said you got a, you, you dropping a single on, on United, Ma is it United Masters, right? Yeah, who was who? Uh, cause I, I think I heard about him. Cause I I was uh I was about to drop. I remember I, I got a poem called Basketball, and I I was thinking about yeah. going through them to get it on NBA Two K. But I was just like, you know, I just rather I rather keep the independence and, and, and control the uh the meat of the the meat of what I'm doing. So I actually I actually been getting some spins on uh tune not tune core uh TikTok. Like people been taking so, a video and sharing it, which has been dope. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Have, have you been um, have you been tapping into to any other you know the social media platforms outside of the norm like the IGs, the Facebooks? Have you been right. seeing? Uh, I have. Like honestly, I've started or you know make sure that I've um, captured my own names of each of those pages with my own domains. But I haven't been using like Snapchat, and TikTok, and all the different you know apps that's outside of the norm like you say um but with this new campaign of this single i'm planning on pushing on all platforms to get as much exposure and to build the buzz as much as possible okay so um and i you know i got a chance to read the bio because i'm you know i'm all about yeah i know i know you from us being around and us vibing and every time we we coming in and out the city we will run into each other um right I know you mentioned that you got a, you got an album coming out, possibly, you know, or or if I'm certain, like with Blue Rock and Blue Rock is is uh, Dame Dash, you know what I'm saying? Can you get an audience the name of it? Uh, the name of the album? Yeah. Uh, right now I'm working on Yellow Caution. Uh, no, saying, right. I'm hold it, you know what I'm saying? No, 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 no problem. Right now, like, like this, like this single, all I got is coming from the album, all like, uh, excuse me, Yellow Caution Tape Three, um, which is like a sequel I've been doing since the first mixtape, Yellow Caution Tape One, okay. and um, I was working on it before I ran into Dame Dash and the Blue Rock label, and um, since we to each other we've collaborated on man over 30 songs and it's just that i have in my my position you know what i'm saying and i know that some that they have in theirs that i, I don't even can remember or could recall yeah. um but right now we just we since like since we was working together we decided to split it up into songs and um the other artists on his label, um, his niece, the son, and myself, also Angela Gold. Um, Can you we were that? all, yeah, Angela Gold. Okay. Uh, Miss Neeks and her son. Okay. And then also myself. We was all on the um, R on on the um, Blue Rock label, independent label. It's like a label that supports independent artists, supports okay. to keep pushing on brand. It just has its own plugs as far as different distributions and you no know, just different all kinds of different stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's dope. So um we was working on some songs, um, and some of those songs are still being selected to be decided if it's gonna be on Yellow Cost and Tech Free. So it's it's still a working process, right? All right. So I wanna I wanna get into the yellow tape, not necessarily just the one that you're dropping now. But you, you know, I want you to tell a little bit about that. But first, like, how did you pull off the opportunity to collaborate with a mogul as such? 
was man, it, it was just was it the was it the leave home? I, you know, what I'm saying I know you writing you writing the project leave home. Was it a part of that thing when you left left Memphis going to L. A. or what? I mean, honestly, man, I can't even lie. It's just all God, man. Because okay. I had no plans on like, and it's weird because I've been planning on coming to California all my life. I had always planned on coming. I had always knew that I was gonna do music, but I didn't never know exactly how, what my trajectory was. I just knew I needed to be out here because this was the industry and the infrastructure that supported my type of craft. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. my vision, yeah, that as well too. Um, so when I came out here, it was just, I mean, I wouldn't say it was luck, it was just destined that, you know, um, I, was, I was actually performing at, a, at a, an open mic event for one of my homeboys from college. I emailed him and hit him up and was just like, you know, I'll be in town for like just the weekend type thing, maybe the full week. And I and I have a show at the end of the weekend. So I was just trying to see whatever else I can get tapped into. And mm -hmm. it was like, yeah, man, I got a networking event on this day and the following day I got an open mic. So I came to both events. And at the second event, the open mic, uh, a photographer um, pulled me to the side and was just like, yo, man, you were dope. I got this opportunity um, for this artist. And he was actually just playing guitar for um, names of other artists, Miss Neeks. Okay. And they was looking for like a band, a live band. Yeah. And uh, he was like, you know, they looking for a guitar player and they also looking for a drummer. And I had my homeboy, Johnny, with me, who also played drums. He from and, Memphis? Yeah, he from Memphis. He from I, think I, Memphis. I think I ran into him uh, at, at, at Stacks with Lil Will and them and Jay. I did. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's who it was. Uh, he grew up right around him. Okay. But, uh, so yeah, we were just like, for sure, we would do it, you know what I mean? We didn't have that much time, really. It was like, the opportunity was like the last day that we were in town. So we came through, we did the thing, you know, they they were like, man, y'all hard, y'all five. So they was like, all right, we're gonna need y'all the next day because this, we're gonna be filming this, and we're gonna have a live audience. So me and Johnny looking at each other like, damn, you know what I mean, like. You done got the tickets to the house. Man, what, like, you know what I mean? We're gonna be missing, we already passed deadline. I mean, cause I had a rental actually, you know what I mean? And I was like, I didn't wanna pass the rental date. Yeah. But, you know, with this kind of opportunity, I was like, fuck it, let's just, yeah, sure. I mean, excuse my language, but let's, you know what I mean? Let's go ahead and go with, with yeah. what's going on. So we did that. And at the end of the show, uh, Dame opened up the floor. It's like, you know, anybody wanna jump on the mic and do anything? So, you know, I was like, shit, no, uh, no. like this don't really happen. So, you know, and take advantage of it. And the rest was history. As soon as I jumped off the mic, he was like, man, I want to do a blues album with you, man. Y'all need to dope. He was like, you're going to be you gonna be able to come back next week. And me and Johnny looked at each other was like, man, we was actually supposed to be going yesterday. So <laughs> it was going to be the night after this. He was like, all right, for sure, Will. When you go, when you come back to LA, and I was like, man, soon. He was like, all right, for sure. And he looked at Miss Neeks was like, all right, we need to find another guitar player, and another drummer for next week. So, you know, my mind was just like, damn, you know, I can't be Yeah. Yeah. Not only that, but in the industry, you know, you got to keep it moving. You know what I mean? Because it seems like you know they don't they won't miss a beat when when it comes to uh, consumers. But so, you ain't gonna have that. You ain't gonna have that same vibe. No, I had to be the same vibe at all. Of course, it wasn't the same vibe. The whole time I was gone, that was calling me every every day. I was like, man, when you coming back? When you coming back? When you coming back? And uh, we came back, and you know, it just it took off from there. Yeah. Well, you know what I'm saying. You know, you got to give people the roses while they're alive, man. So I just want to say, you know, keep up, keep up the dope work. You know what I'm saying, and don't don't stop, man. You know what I'm saying. So like, and and and. Like again, I want to go forward, but then I want to go to go to yellow tape after this. So, uh, right. I know you. I know you probably got a lot of a lot of gems from Dane. You know what I'm saying, being who he is and what he on. But um, what gems did he get from you in return, though? Because I know he got he. Uh, I know he had to get some from you, bro. I mean, yeah, like like I said, plenty of songs. Like you know, what I mean. Two songs specifically that went on his album um, that they just released recently. Um, so you know, what I mean, not only just music, but we we had a lot of connection because we had a lot of um, real conversations. You know, what I mean, um, and he, he just saw, I guess, in me the spirit that I was hungry but also humble. But I, you know, me being from down south, 
it's just a different kind of culture with him being from New York and up north. Mm-hmm. And um, the most thing that I can definitely say that he that he got for me was soul. You know what I mean? It was yeah. genuineness. You know what I mean? Raw talent. Um, it's just a humble kid trying to you know make, trying to make his way, find his way. Yeah. Well, like I said, man, I'm glad you're on your business. You know what I'm saying? And you got you. You got to a place where you got out of town and you actually performing and you're doing your thing, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. everybody don't get them opportunities. But when when presented with the opportunity, you made something happen and you made something of it. So again, oh, that's that's all. So um yellow tape, like where where did the concept and idea to 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 do the yellow tape? Was that was that saying saying you killing the game? What what was going on? I mean, it's a little bit of all of that, you know what I mean? Everything that comes with the, the, I guess what they say, the stigma, or really just when you see a caution tape, the whole vibe that come from there, you know what I mean? It's beware. Yeah. Um, and honestly, you know, on my acoustic guitar, um, the same guitar that's tatted on my arm, I got a piece of caution tape on it. My um, And the name of that guitar is called Caution. And so it's like really a reflection of me, and it's also an emotional um interpretation of the the season that I'm in, you know what I mean? Or the reflection of life or the reflection of reality. And I'm just vocalizing it in a form of, you know, hip hop trap, soul, R and B rock kind of reggae kind of vibe. Man, so I mean, um man. that's jam. I mean it's just it's genuine man because like it started from my first mixtape was No Feelings. And all of these, you can check out on that pip. They're still online. Um, but after that, after No Feelings, I wanted to do something more original. And mm-hmm. with Yellow Caution Tape, I felt like um, it was, I think on that tape, I got some some beats by High Rod. Shout out to High Rod from Memphis. He's a producer that uh, made Five Star Chick by Yo Gotti and a bunch of other bangers by a bunch of other good artists. But I, I think I had a, a few beats by him, and I just was trying to, like, you know what I mean, incorporate as much originality by infusing my guitar, singing, and rapping. Like, really trying to set the tone and getting that, that, that single beat sound out mm-hmm. there. And, and and also showing mixing a little versatility in it as well. I definitely remember trying to be still show my versatility. I was still really pretty much trying to find my sound. And, you know, people, because I sang, you know, I come from a city where, you know what I mean? If you if you sing, it's either like you're just doing church music or you're doing like R and B or some kind of blues. And so it's all, those you you kind of automatically have two audiences for that. And if yeah, you, you gotta, rock you gotta, or you do rap. like, and it's it's kind of different because like I'm not like a rapper, you know what I mean? And I'm not just like a blues artist, and then I'm not just a straight up Memphian because I'm Jamaican as well. So it's hard for people to kind of really gravitate to my vibe, I, at least I feel in the city because like, sure enough, I done done plenty of stuff and I know plenty of people and plenty of people know me and I, I'm always doing big stuff there. But it seems like some of the platforms don't really give me the shine or the justice that I, I feel like, I feel that I deserve because I don't really fit in a particular box that the norm or the typical Memphis sound is. So um, I know that was one of the no. reasons for the Yellow Caution Tape too. <clears throat> No, I, I I know what you mean, and I and I feel it because I remember being one of the first artists on the underground around you know around Memphis with an actual yeah. record where the Grizzlies was playing Grid Grind, you know what I'm saying? And it was like for me, it was like kicking in the door for everybody else because after I did it, it seemed like all the homies was either performing in in the arena, you know what I'm saying? Like a Chinese Connection. Um, my homie CB on, you know what I'm saying? Like, CB on, it seemed like everybody Al was part of, yeah, <clears throat> or Al Capone, yeah, Al Capone, been, you know what I'm saying, been rocking, but um, just the just the vibe of 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 what you're doing, man, you know what I'm saying? Like, like I said, it's appreciated, so I can't understand why you said it took time for people to to kind of grasp it. They ain't really, they ain't really necessarily understand it, but overall, they, they, you know, what I'm saying, eventually they have to. They gotta, they gotta give the credit because it's like you coming with a real mixture of music that ain't being heard in Memphis. 
the reggae the reggae is somewhat underground, you know what I'm saying? On the on the scene, you know, amongst us. But like you said, it's gospel, it's blues, it's the hardcore rap. But it's like, shit, we 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 started Memphop down there. One of the homies did. And it's like, I was just glad to see stuff like stacks, the music academy come back around, you know what I'm saying? Like running in the Al Green and all that kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? Um like I said, you said you were from DC. You know, I, we saying shout out to Chocolate City because that's that's what we that's what we knew it as growing up. But in the bio, green sleeves, right? Yeah. I ain't gonna lie, I ain't know what the hell that was. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, I went and checked it out. I was like, oh, this the this the music they used to play during the holidays and and, and shit like that, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> but like, um, what, do you remember that time? Or like, what what kind of what kind of drew you in? Because I know you I know you said moms was like, that's when she kind of knew like, hey man, my son got a got an ear and a neck for this thing, and I'm a, I'm gonna go for it. Do yeah, you like pretty much like you know what was going on at the house? It wasn't like it wasn't no house problems and no violence and like that, you know what I mean? I mean, my brothers and them, they was in the street gang banging and shit like that. So they was looking at life at a different kind of perspective through a different window. And I was just like kind of there. I was the last with seven kids. And, um, you know, I grew up very um, spiritually conscious as even as a youth, you know what I mean? And so just like, the things that I would decide and would decide not to do kind of helped me to find this sort of environment that really helped me to put my energy and to put my, you know, my essence or to vocalize my my spirit in a in a physical form or you know in an audio form. So it was just really something that just like I really fucked with because it was just something that it was attractive to me, just mm-hmm. seeing how. Um, just at first, you know, cultivating music is always cool. But when I saw um, for the first time these guys on stage playing guitar and singing, performing in front of the live audience, and I was just seeing how the audience was just really just, you know, I me mean, feeding and, and speaking. They were like speaking, exchanging energy, and really was understanding to just do music and just do that motion. And I knew that that was something very powerful and something that was like cool. It was like being up on the stage, it looked cool while you're doing a fly, you know what I mean? So I figured if I could do that, and not only just do it because I see somebody else do it, but you know, put my own, put my me into it, you know what I mean? Um, that's really where it just came from. Um, it started with, you know, like you said, Green Sleeves playing the piano, then I was with violin, my big brother, and then was playing violin. Mm. But I think my mom put me there because she just saw that I like music and didn't know exactly where. And I liked it, and I still pick up the violin from time to time, but, um, you know, it didn't last that long, me being, you know, going through the instructor and having recitals. So me picking up the guitar was just, like, automatic, you know what I mean? And me singing was kind of going hand in hand. And it seems that all throughout my life, I've always been producing and, and having fruity loops or having some sort of way to record myself. So, you know, it just kind of all came together together with the internet and, you know I mean it just it just you know I mean that's just kind of it was just natural attraction yeah so like um you know this this is you know here you know reading on the bio when it was like you were saying at five you were doing this right so at five I was outgrowing my goddamn clothes <laughs> <laughs> like shit overnight and I'm I'm telling my folks like man, who is this white boy on the wall? Y'all praising man, like man, y'all crazy. This some motherfucker, you know. But um, so I I I wanted to bring up like certain points now and kind of like get insight of where you were at, at different times. So first, I want to I want to tell you a little bit about I don't know if you know Gino Young. You ever heard of him? Gino, he an R and B singer. Yeah. Yeah, I know Gino. I know Gino real good. So, so peep it. Gino, Gino was uh at one of Tanya Dyson's events, right? Okay. So yeah. I'm like, you know, 
I'm at a point, this is before I had wrote that Grit Grind song, and I was trying to figure out, like, I want to improve my writing, bro. And I'm like, hey, Gino, I ain't, I didn't know his background. I didn't know, you know what I'm saying? I ain't know he was writing for Badu and, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. collaborating with a lot of artists. And he even had his own music that's dope as hell. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So I was like, Gino, bro, like, how can I get, uh, how can I get better at my, at my writing? Yeah. Bro was like, uh, take your five favorite artists. You know what I'm saying? And write a song from each one of them verbatim. Yeah. So I'm like, shit. And he said, you know, if it was the beat that caught your attention, he was like, write the beat on the outside, on the outline of the uh, song. But as you writing the song, listen to the music. You know what I'm saying? So you can hear it. So then I was like, cool. And then he was like, I couldn't remember what else he was saying as far as like, it was something else that you want to, you know, you want to you wanna pick from him. So I was like, all right. Man, you know, I got the writing. I got the writing, writing, writing. Instead of me doing five, I did like 150 songs. Snoop, D'Angelo. So it's like when I heard Grit Grind, the beat. Matter of fact, I had already had the lyrics before the beat. You know what I'm saying? And that was that was crazy for me. So I'm saying that to take you back to that first song you wrote and published. Like what was that experience for you? Uh, writing the uh, alma mater for my middle school. It was, um, I guess it didn't really become reality until I was writing more music after that because I really didn't understand what publish, what it meant to be published, you know what I mean? Um, and then it, then once you get, once you get to it, explain what publish means, as, you know what I'm saying, as you get into your piece. Right. Um, so at that time I was in middle school, I was in what, like, the, I was in the, um, eighth grade. Okay. And um, I had wrote the alma mater, which is like the, the school's theme song mm -hmm. um, for my middle school, American Way Middle in Memphis, Tennessee. And, um, you know, it was a competition. I won the competition, whoever song was best won. So my song won. Mm -hmm. And, um, not only was it just stamped and still is the school song, it, they publish it and make sure that it's notarized and you know, it makes sure it's official and all that stuff. So at that time, like I really didn't really understand it. I just thought it was kind of cool. You know, I won a couple of competition. I got to be principal for the day and you know, all these kind of cool perks that came with it. Um, but later on in life, as me trying to do my own thing and not even really was trying to be independent, just really trying to learn, be a student of the industry and of, 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 of music business, um, I started learning why the, it's important to have your music published because you can have a song that's, you originally, you got the be you own all of that stuff. And you put it out, even on the internet, like you release it for free. These certain platforms have licensing agreements with certain um, publishers music publishing registration companies like BMI or ASCAP or CSAT. And what these companies do is they register your song in a catalog underneath your name, your artist name, and your government name to have it all, you know, connect. And they give you a number, like a ID number. Yeah. And um, what it does is it keeps a file of all your material. So whenever it's released, um, these companies that play that, that pay um, licensing fees um, also are tracking which songs who are, are licensed to which company. And if you don't have an actual publishing company, not the BMI ASCAP, but a publishing company that represents finding these, um, this data and corresponding with BMI or ASCAP and with the YouTubes or the Apple or, you know, the whatever platform, even clubs when they play your music, Mm -hmm. or live venues, they, all of these different platforms have to pay a licensing fee be, to be able to play licensed music. Um, so I didn't know any of that type of lingo until relatively a few years ago. Um, it's just like, like I said, just learning and growing about the business and really trying to find the best you know, thing that's gonna benefit me as an artist independently. No, that makes sense, man. That makes sense. So. Um... Now, 
my next, the next one is Stax Music Academy. So, you know, like, just like we just did with the first song you wrote, yeah. um, what was what was Stax Music Academy? Like, what did it represent in your life? Even like when you look back at that time, like what did you learn? Just you know what I'm saying? Just 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 tell us a little bit about it. Um, you know, going into Stax as a student at that time, I didn't really know the historical legacy and uh, influence that Stax music did have on that period of time, has on this period of time, and has on future generation of music. Mm -hmm. um, I was just going there. It was an after school program for me to be able to learn how to be like a performing artist because like I said, I've been recording all my life. And at this particular point, which was like my 10th and 11th and 12th, the end of my 10th grade, my 11th and 12th grade year of high school, mm -hmm. um, they really instilled in me like how to be, how to be on stage, how to work the stage, how to communicate with other band, uh, band members, um, how to be able to read and write music theory. Um, what else? You know, they taught me the ethics of touring, getting per diem. Um, you know, that was my first time performing on major platforms and having people record it. It just, it really, what I didn't know that it was really preparing me for what I do myself or I, I'm doing now, you know what I mean? And um, they also taught me not only th those skills, but they taught me like, you know what I mean? The, the, the influence that Stax Music has, like I said, on the past, because in the past, you know, they had a uh, political and um, a lot of social influence on society at that time, because in the 60s, late 60s and 70s, during that time when Martin Luther King was assassinated and, you know, the, um, the citation workers was on strike, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of music was really pushing the, the, the like I said, the power to the people and really keeping the people you know, positive and keeping them with hope. Um, so Memphis music was like a real prestigious thing for me to be able to be there and, and not only just learn, but you know, they also gave me the opportunity to remix a record, a, a original stack record. Um, they gave me the opportunity to remix Shad um, and we re remixed and recorded, yeah. We remixed, recorded it in the Stack studio and performed it on live TV at the Trumpet Awards in Atlanta. Man, that's cold. You know what I mean? Like, just to hear it. And, and I, I've been a big Stax fan, you know what I'm saying? Just just in the past with Isaac Hayes and, and yeah. Al Green, too. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And there's several other artists that I know right now I ain't able to name, but I'm pretty sure, like, yeah. the history that right. I know that, that we always had in the city. Yeah. Like you said, it's prestigious. I know, yeah. know Wu-Tang used a lot of their music. Yeah. I know Talil Kweli used a lot of the music. You know Everybody. what I'm saying? Everybody. So, you know, to see that the 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 younger artists now are even they still vibing on some Memphis music with uh DJ Paul and Juicy J and Three Six Mafia. Yeah, for sure. Even uh Tommy Wright the third, the sound, even even like uh Play of Fly. It's like the sound of today is still what was represented and what's been been through the threads of who we are, man, as 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 uh Artist and his show. Show so um the next I think the next the next point is definitely Berkeley. So like what was what was the experience in the transition coming from Memphis where you learning learning the soul, learning music theory, learning how to perform, learning how to work the crowd. How important was the, the the transition to Berkeley, you know, for you now? You know what I'm saying? I know, I know you gained a lot that most of us didn't get in high school, especially from a standpoint of business where you talk about the per diems. What did yeah. you get from from Berkeley? Um, well, Stacks, they helped connect the dots on that relationship, getting accepted to Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Okay. And um Unfortunately, I didn't have enough money to pay for the tuition at that time. Okay. And um, I didn't get to enroll immediately. I got you. So um, instead, I stayed home for a little while and really started to like 
switched my TRE. And in the process, I had some homeboys that was also like some, I guess, bandmates while I was in Stacks that was attending Berkeley. Okay. And uh, they invited me to come up there and sit in on different courses and meet different, you know, musicians and professors and just, you know, pretty much be a student without paying. And so I was living there for like, man, like, what, like three, if I'm not, I don't want to lie, it was no more than three months. It was for sure one month. But, you know what I mean, it was, it was so much being creative and, you know, good weed, you know what I mean, the time just flies. So, um, <laughs> For real, I know I produced my uh, mixtape "Walking Through the City of the Day," and I know the majority of that was produced by Hot Rod for sure. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I mean, got, what I got that song live from the City of the Day, but I'm with you though. Yeah, yeah. I remember that record. Yeah. I believe. Yeah. Um, but you were saying uh, Hot Rod, Hot Rod was up there too. No, nah, no, nah, he wasn't up there. He was still in Memphis. We were still doing shooting stuff through the internet. Okay. But while I was up there, you know what I mean. The only thing I can say that I gained from being at Berkeley and being up there was just knowing how, um, like one of my homeboys, for example, he was a bass player, and his first year being attendant, he got accepted. He he got an offer to be on tour with Victor Wooten, which is like one of the best players in the world. Yeah, and he turned that opportunity down to stay and get an education, and it just that was kind of the first time I've ever been exposed to somebody getting like. Uh, an opportunity from yeah from a from a major and turning it down and and you wouldn't think of it like because like rap you gotta see it as like a, a major label or you know what I mean like Maybach or um, and, um all money ends or a, a label that's kind of independent but still big like that mm-hmm. but but for an artist directly to ask me to join on Twitter that's the same approach in the musician's eyes you know what I mean um. And he was just like, you know, it's the show. I, I love it. And, you know, he turned it down or whatever. And he still got the opportunity later on. But he just kind of showed me how you kind of got to stay down with your craft and stay down with perfecting what you start. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and so cool. that's kind of what I meant there. Because while I was there, a lot of people was like, yeah, you sound good. I did a few shows and stuff. But that was kind of looking for some material. That's like, where can I buy you? Where can I check you out? And I... I had some stuff, but it wasn't all centralized. It wasn't all stamped and branded, uh, you know, organized like, you know what I mean? It was still kind of grassroots from the ground up and working with different people, uh, which I still work with different people now, but it's, it's kind of more, uh, you know, it's more of a structure to it now. So that's what I really learned from being in Boston, kind of tightening up on my business and on my brand. Okay. So uh, the next point is Australia. I'm just gonna say the word. I don't know what's you know what I'm saying. What you what your thoughts are of, of Australia? What was that experience? Don't ask you that. Man, it was uh, it was cool. It was really nice because you know I'm a people. I'm a I'm a you know, I'm, I'm a person of a man of the people. I don't prefer to be like on the top. I prefer to be amongst the people, the locals, and see what's going on. Keep my ears low to the ground. You know what I'm saying? So. I was kind of peeping the scene and, and learning more so about the aboriginals and you know, yeah. learning the, the culture and the history of how they was pretty much colonized. And I mean, within a few years ago, within you know, within this uh, century uh, time span, um, how a lot of them, the kids were kidnapped and put in the camps and parents was uh, stripped from their children or, uh, and killed or put into prisons and all kinds of stuff that's still going on all around the world today. But, you know, I was just wanting to be, you know, a student. Like, I'm always a student of life. I always want to learn and incorporate this kind of stuff in my music. So I was kind of, even at that age and at that period of time, and being in stacks and being on tour, I was just, like, very uh, observant of not only just the, the, the chemistry and dynamics of the different cultures between, you know, the different races, rather, within that culture of Australia, but learning the economy, learning how people really respect. And, man, I mean, like, love like soul music because that's when I really learned that it wasn't nothing wrong with being a soul artist because people was really like fainting at the fact at the sight of seeing us which we were you know essentially nobody but they was gassing us up and putting us in newspapers and we were doing big shows on big stages and doing interviews on the news and I don't know if I already said that but like they they were just putting us in a lot of prestigious places and, and meeting with the ambassador the American ambassador um, you know, trying kangaroo, like eating kangaroo, all kinds of crazy stuff. But you know, I was just that's just mostly what I was just peeping, just 
how the original people, how they've been affected uh, and what's the result and the dynamics of that. That make, to me, from the sounds of it, it's kind of like me being in Atlanta, you know what I'm saying? Like, it made me respect my hometown, you know what I'm saying? Like, even more. Yeah. It's because uh, they have a lot of pride for Atlanta. I respect it, you know what I'm saying? But I got a lot of pride for Memphis. I know a lot of artists that do too, but it's almost okay. like the same love that Atlanta gives, they get it back from the city. Yeah. They don't always happen in Memphis. No. You know what I'm saying? And that, that's, that has to change. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm not saying we got to look for it, but. You know what I noticed? It, I don't think it's actually the love because, you know, I've, I had a conversation with my mama and a few colleagues of mine, and I was saying, you know, I got to change my, not necessarily my, my trajectory of my demographic, but the type of people that I would consider my consumers because people who support you are different from the people who will, who will be your consumers. Because consumers, they go off the trend, they go off of what's hot now. They don't really have to know how, how, what the whole history of how it was made, just as long as it's right there in front of them, if it's presented right, they're going to be consuming with too long as you don't do nothing out of care. You know what I mean? Yeah. But people who support you, they're going to love you regardless whether your product is good or bad. They're going to love you whether you are in business or not. And, you know, necessarily at the same time, those people who support you aren't always going to be the people who are going to buy stuff or going to be the first people to purchase, you know, something that is a part of your campaign. So I wouldn't necessarily say that Memphis don't have as much love because Memphis definitely got love, but they're going right. to represent off the top. But that's they just ain't got the money. They don't have the infrastructure to support, yeah, that's you know, I'm, these independent businesses and platforms. So that's what I'm getting into, the actual support. Like, I, 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 I probably did say the word wrong as far as love. So it is, you know, like, it is a lot of love because on the, on the back end, it's a lot of people that are, that are call out a song or whatever that I've done. I'm like, you know, surprised by that. But it's just more or less like... Yeah. The support that's here, like you said, the infrastructure, the infrastructure here in Atlanta, it got set up from the from the fact of uh, Maynard Jackson, the mayor of the city, was laying out contracts for so-called black people in here, you know, in Atlanta, to be able to say, okay, we're gonna help build this airport. By building the airport up, the money trickle down. You know what I'm saying? So you can have a, a, a Jermaine Dupri, you know what I'm saying? You can have a TLC, you can have an Outcast. On to Lil John, to Ludacris, to Monica, to to Usher. Lil Baby, to Usher, you know what I'm saying? Ti. So it's like two chains, Jeezy, and it's just go like on. it lists go on and on. So it's like we got the same talent. We just yeah, have to go. We sure. just have, we if just not, gotta if not more. If not more, we just gotta go yeah. snatch the bag and bring it back. And that's what's yeah. you know what I'm saying. That's to be around the likes of, of the artists that I've been around. It's just like. It's just a different, to me, it's a different mentality of cat from Memphis. Male you know, it's, it's, we, we also do have to take some accountability. It ain't just because we don't have the money to be able, because, you know, like, it's, it's a competitive, a, a, it's a very competitive city when it comes to music, no matter what genre you're doing. It's, but that's cause because everybody, everybody do music. Not only that, it's, it's not a lot of opportunities. It's I mean, not, there are opportunities, but it's, but it's not, not a lot of them. No. And because of that, they're not going to be too quick to like support you because they trying to get their stuff heard. So it ain't really like they hating or they no, 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 crabbing no. a barrel. It's just if, if we if I was eating, I wouldn't have no problem with helping you eat because I'm eating. But if I'm not eating and my folks are eating, man, we repping TRE, period. We ain't posting no woo woo woo, you know what I'm saying? So that's kind of the mentality. And not only that, but it's just that a lot of the people who are in the city don't get to leave the city. Yeah. They don't have a reason to leave the city. Yeah. And when you have that type of exposure to different cultures, different levels of tax brackets, different you know type of uh, cultures, yeah. you learn the importance of your money because your, not necessarily that money is, makes you something because that's definitely not the case. But your money is essentially like a piece of a voice. It's a piece of a, a action that you can take. It's a, tra a piece of transportation that can get you to some knowledge or get you to resources or get you to a community of people that you wouldn't necessarily have before. So when you are exposed to this type of being away from Memphis that not necessarily don't support each other, but don't have the funds to support small businesses or don't have 
the people to support campaigns and stuff like that because they they need some incentive. It's just that, you know what I mean, we have to be able to start supporting each other and using our own skills and our own services within our own community so that way we can value other businesses, other independent businesses, because there's, it's, it don't make sense to where, you know, let's just say uh, Susie's Lawn Care. It don't make sense why Susie's Lawn Care ain't got no Instagram uh, promo video, no, no, no oh, logo God. made, oh, no God. music done by one of these local artists. I know you done heard, uh, yeah. uh, what's they call? What's that number? Um, when you when you crash, what's the look? I, um, I know you talking about. Oh, I was about to say five two eight cash. It ain't five two. Not five two eight cash, but uh, oh, you talking about six six eight three seven? That's y'all there. Seven, I oh, think oh. so. But it's a you know what I'm talking about. They be they be rapping. They got Christmas. Yeah. Man, they got gospel on. songs. They got all kind of. They be rapping up there all down here, though. I ain't gonna lie. I'm telling you, though, man, but they got them for different seasons. So if it's Christmas time, they got a Christmas song. If yeah. it's for, if they playing it on the gospel station, they got a yeah. gospel version. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, but I'm saying, though, you know, they using these different type of demographics of people within the community that support that business to be able to reflect and represent the people that like that kind of music. Yeah. So it's, it's no reason why Susie's Lawn Care can't be able to have all these different people that's in the same, in North Memphis, that can do it designing the logos that, that do a uh, uh, social or uh, marketing that do, you know, all these different skills. So we just have to start, you know, opening our mouth and speaking to one another and not being afraid of each other and start working together. And, you know, it do help by leading by example by some of these people with money and some of these big labels. Lead. that I, I haven't seen any offices or no businesses in the, in the city that reflect some type of collaboration. But, you know what I mean, until then, you know, I'm going to have to just, me and you going to have to lead the way, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's, and that's why I reached, that's why I reached out, because I'm like, you getting ready to drop a project, and I'm like, it makes sense for me to say, hey, bro, send me the work so I can post it, so I can do what I do, get it to a whole nother audience, <clears throat> drive, you know what I'm saying? Even if it ain't number 10 people, even if it ain't number 100, even if it ain't number 1,000, if, if 100 of them people spending money with you, Hey, bro, you don't owe me nothing. I don't need, you know what I'm saying? Like, for me, it's not the money. For me, it's the exposure of, hey, man, bro, I expose your music to somebody else that has never heard of you. You know what I'm saying? So now it's like, shit, are you you good? You eating? You straight? So now it's like, well, what can we talk about next? So, like, um, I'm going to bring up gar uh, Gardens Art. Let me ask you about that. What is Gardens Art? So gardens are life. Um, sometimes you might see me refer to it as GAL, G-A-L. Mm -hmm. It's a um, nonprofit organization that was founded by um, myself and Dr. Eziza Risha. And what it is, is a platform that not only caters to agriculture um, and health, um, not, and, and that's through um, working together through different generations and through different social structures like programs in schools for children, um, providing gardens and teaching them how to plant and how to um, harvest the, and teaching about different seasons of harvest and different plants. Um, but we also work with legislation, legislations and, and different people who work in city council who correspond with like the community development of the CDC and um, developing different parts of Memphis. And right now we're, we're, uh, we're putting together an event or a program to where it's like giving back to the community, having some live music, teaching people about the heritage and history of North Memphis. Um, and also teaching them about, you know, agriculture and providing them, like I said, with live music and healthy food and, and, and an opportunity space to network and to be able to grow and share ideas and, and different creatives. Um, so it's, it's pretty much like a, a launching pad right now. And this is just the beginning of, this is probably the second or third year that we've been in existence. I gotta, I gotta connect cause I got some, uh, I got some people on the health side and the ag side, you know what I'm saying? That, that need to know about that. So, you know what I'm saying? When we get done, we'll talk about that. Then I'll plug you for sure. Some some it's it's a couple other things I want to discuss. Uh, one one being, have you ever heard of Vest V E Z T? 
is that that program that Nipsey was talking about? Like an yeah. investing company? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I heard about it. Yeah. So you so the the company is actually built on a cryptocurrency Ethereum. Are you familiar with the cryptocurrency? A little bit. All right. So we gonna you know here go here going forward. We gonna have to we gonna have to talk on it because it's just more or less. The world is, is becoming more and more on the crypto side and the digital side when it comes to money. So yeah. we can start monetizing things on a digital level too. Me, right. me saying invest and you saying Nipsey, uh, that was something that I saw from him like three years ago. One of the videos that he did, it only got 30,000 views, but I actually um, I actually started getting paid, paid from the app. You know what I'm saying? Where let's say for instance, single Brumfield, uh, Yellow, what you say? Yellow caution. All right, caution yeah. tape. All right, yeah. so say the caution tape. You just got a single off of there. You could take a record to vets to vets and say, um, I want to offer on the ISO, which is the initial song offering. You can offer a percentage of your royalties direct to you know directly to the consumer. They can say, well, I want to put five, twenty, a hundred, a thousand dollars up for that song, right? Yeah. And they can you know, they they'll get paid the, the royalties for three, five, or ten years. But you get the cash that you need. You might say, I wanna, I wanna do this uh short film towards uh towards caution tape. Yeah. You dig what I'm saying? Yeah. So now it's like, it's songs that I've invested into. It's been paying 30, 50, 70 cent. But I'm like, okay, this is just right now. Just imagine this song three years from now. Then this song five years from now, then 10 years from now. On a digital platform that's paying me out. But I have to introduce it to you to say, hey man, go check it out. Because now if we get a song on here that you already got out, Hey man, why? How come we can't get? How come we can't get a hundred of our partners to put ten dollars on it? And say, bro, we owe a, we own a percentage of the song. We can promote this shit on on uh, social media or wherever. And now we helping you eat. We helping you eat. We help, we getting paid too. So it's just like you know that's yeah. It's, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I I see you some of the ones like I got ownership in like a uh, wild thing from Tone Low. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Crush on you from Lil Kim. Those are just two songs. Hotel Suite from Nipsey Hussle. I just put, you know what I'm saying? Like probably roughly like $50 total on all three of them songs. Yeah. Which is not a, it's not a large percentage, but the fact I'm able to invest and get something back. We got, you know what I'm saying? We got to start looking at them things. So uh, I see that guitar behind you. You, uh, you hooked up to play anything? <laughs> no, not right now. I just got it just to let the people know. I'm ready whenever. If I need to, I will. No, nah, it's just crazy. Nah, you ain't got to, man. I uh, you know, I ain't gonna hold you too much longer, man. I just, again, I'm uh, I'm glad that I got a chance to interview you. You know, what I'm saying for the podcast, it's been a uh, been a long time coming. But I think this was the proper time because I've been, you know, what I'm saying I've been watching your progress for a long time, and to say like. Man, this man in LA, shit, left home and you probably ain't where you wanna be, but you on your way. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, just know you in the you in the present space for a reason. Hey, like I said, I know you got some gems from 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 uh Dane, but that motherfucker had to get some, you know what I'm saying, some gems from you too, man. I already know. That's just that's just the respect that I got for you, knowing that man, you out there doing your thing, man. You know, hats off. But um, before we go, yeah. before we go, man, just again, tell the people your uh, your social media tags. You know what I'm saying? Um, again, where they can get the albums and um, and I also, you know, you can send me the info and I add it too, where people can check it out too. So once again, my name is Singer B, Singer Brownfield. You can check me out on Instagram and Facebook at Singer Brownfield S I N G A. B R O M F I E L D. 
You can find all my music on all of the major platforms like Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, YouTube, Google Play, um, SoundCloud, and you can just search Singer B, S I N G A, the letter B. Definitely. Thank you again for having me on your show, too, for real. Yeah, man. Man, I ain't gonna hold you, man. Uh, this is Art of Architect with more than Haircut Podcast, man. We out. <laughs>